The largely ceremonial first moon landing was over and, as NASA was preparing for the scientific missions, politicians were preparing big cuts to the space program. Toward the end of the 1960s, America finally had something to celebrate. Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins had returned safely from the moon. For America, the decade had started with an uncomfortable realisation. Cold War adversary, the Soviet Union, had a commanding lead in space technology. The United States had been seized by a wave of anti-communist paranoia. Nine years and $17 billion later, Apollo 11 had planted the US flag on the surface of the moon. First step foot upon the moon. July 1969, it is. It came in peace for all mankind. Around the planet, 600 million people had watched on TV. The world's population was watching history, and they knew it. Uh, Tranquility Base, this is Houston. Can we get both of you on the camera for a minute, please? At beaches and rivers in central Florida, one million Americans had turned out to see the launch of Apollo 11. November the 14th, 1969, was a wet day at the Kennedy Launch Center. Numbers that turned out to watch the launch of Apollo 12 had dropped by two-thirds. After the huge viewing numbers attracted by Apollo 11, NASA upgraded all aspects of the television coverage for the remaining moon landings. Pete Conrad would command the mission with rookie Alan Bean and command module pilot Dick Gordon. Their destination, the Ocean of Storms, just near the landing site of Surveyor 3, the unmanned craft that had touched down two years earlier. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engines running, commit, liftoff. We have liftoff, 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The driving rain was not seen as a problem. Although high winds could delay a launch, the Saturn V was an all-weather vehicle and the wet conditions were not a factor. Pressure clear the tower. I got a pitch and a roll program and this thing is really going. Roger, Pete. Soon after liftoff, lightning struck Apollo 12 and ran down the ionized exhaust trail to the launch tower. We had everything in the world drop out. Roger. All instrumentation in the command module went haywire and telemetry readouts on the ground were showing garbage. Apollo 12 Houston, try FCE to auxiliary, over. For a short while, nobody in the craft or on the ground knew what had gone wrong. FCE to auxiliary. Finally, the crew was asked to flip an obscure reset switch. Only Alan Bean knew where it was. It restored all instrumentation and the mission could continue. Houston, go for safety. Got a good S2, gang. Roger, we copy, Pete. You're looking good. This had happened at a critical period of powered flight. Mission control had come very close to calling an abort. Your thrust is looking good, Pete. The single Earth orbit was spent checking all systems before Apollo 12 was given the all clear to go to the moon. Right, Pete, your uh, fuel cells look good down here. 
After the huge television audiences for the Apollo 11 lunar mission, NASA had equipped Apollo 12 with a colour camera so that audiences around the world could see higher quality pictures from the surface of the moon. The second landing on the moon benefited greatly from design changes derived from the Apollo 11 experience. Baffles inside the lunar module's fuel tanks prevented unwanted sloshing that had confused the flight computer. Correct. 81, 32, 36, coming down. The landing went exactly as planned, with the astronauts recognizing all the landmarks in the vicinity of the Surveyor 3 probe. He's got it made. Come on in there. 24 feet. Contact light. Roger, copy contact. TV starting to... But as Pete Conrad climbed toward the lunar surface in the United States, it was 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning, and very few people were watching the live television pictures. Viewer ratings were important for NASA. They knew keeping the American taxpayer on side was an important part of convincing politicians that the space agency's generous funding should be maintained. As Alan Bean joined Conrad on the lunar surface, he grabbed the TV camera to relocate it and inadvertently pointed it at the sun. They were the last live Apollo 12 TV pictures from the moon. The pinpoint landing, the much longer stay on the moon and the larger volume of return samples all made Apollo 12 a technical success. But NASA had wanted to keep the American public engaged with the space program and the only pictures anyone saw were short film grabs. Americans were losing interest in space. After the return of Apollo 12, there were still eight more Saturn V launch vehicles in production enough to stretch as far as Apollo 20. But in January 1970, Apollo 20 was cancelled, and soon the planned Apollo 18 and 19 missions were also scrapped. As NASA was preparing to reap the benefits of space engineering and lunar research, the program was being curtailed. Things would change slightly for Apollo 13. NASA rescheduled the mission's lunar activity to coincide with prime viewing time across the United States. This would cost TV networks money, and they were not happy. Commander Jim Lovell had flown around the moon as command module pilot on Apollo 8. This would be his fourth space flight. His colleagues were both first-time astronauts. The lunar module pilot was Fred Hayes, but the third member of the team had come from the backup crew just three days before launch. Command module pilot Jack Swigert replaced the original crew member, Ken Mattingly, who had been exposed to German measles. Mattingly watched the launch from Mission Control in Houston. Eight. Ignition sequence has started. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. Its objective on the moon was the Fra Moro Highlands, named after the adjacent Fra Moro crater. During powered flight, a second stage engine cut out early. The remaining units burned for slightly longer to compensate, but this was no major problem. Translunar injection happened smoothly, and the crew soon pulled out their colour TV camera to entertain the people back on Earth. But apart from the people in mission control, no one was watching. The TV networks failed to broadcast the transmission sent from Apollo 13.
Dean, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. Soon after they had ceased their transmission, with the spacecraft three quarters of the way to the moon, an explosion took out the command module's main power supply. Can say again, please. Oh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Nobody understood what had happened, but it soon became obvious that Apollo 13 would not land on the moon. Stand by, 13. We're looking at it. Jack Aquarius. Uh... With the command module effectively dead, the lunar lander now became the astronaut's sole source of power. Its descent engine would be used for all course corrections. The spacecraft continued out and around the moon on a free return trajectory. Now that's an Atlantic landing site. A landing in the South Atlantic would get them back quickest, but there were no recovery ships in that area. Before Apollo 13 disappeared behind the moon, ground staff began recalculating the burn that would return the craft to the Pacific Ocean. While there was enough food and oxygen to last till the return to Earth, water and power would be critical. Before long, temperatures in the craft had dropped to near freezing. With strictly rationed water, Fred Hayes got a urinary tract infection. The plan was to restore power to the command module using the re-entry batteries just before they hit the Earth's atmosphere. This had never been done before, so a team of experts, including Ken Mattingly, began experimenting with different procedures in a simulator. NASA's space program was back in the headlines, but not for the reasons they wanted. Simulations of the power-up sequence were complicated because condensation, caused by the low temperatures in the command module, threatened to short out the electrical system. But finally, a procedure was radioed to the crew. The rescue showed NASA at its best, creatively solving difficult problems as they arose and returning the three astronauts safely. Apollo 13 would become known as a successful failure. The Apollo program begins adding new technology. Alan Shepard was NASA's first man in space. Though his Mercury capsule, Freedom 7, had only flown for 15 minutes, he was destined to become an important part of America's space program. In 1964, he was diagnosed with Meniere's disease and suspended from all flight activities. He spent the Gemini program as chief of the astronaut office. After corrective surgery, he was restored to flight duty and eventually was made commander of Apollo 14. His command module pilot was Stuart Rusa. And the lunar module pilot was Ed Mitchell. Apollo 14's objective was Fra Moro, the same area in the lunar highlands that had been targeted by the aborted Apollo 13. It would be the last of the H-type missions that carried no vehicle. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Launch commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff from Apollo 14. Three minutes past the hour. Finally, after almost 10 years, Alan Shepard was back in space. Not long after Apollo 14 reached orbit, his space flight time had doubled. Like all previous Apollo missions, it would be more complex than the one that preceded it. And like all Apollo missions, there would be problems. 
Docking with the lunar module should have been routine, but on this occasion, the mechanism would not lock. After five attempts, there was still no success. Okay, Houston, uh, we did it twice. On the sixth attempt, Stu Russo made a more aggressive use of his thrusters, and the two craft locked together. We got some, Houston. In lunar orbit, after the lunar module Antares had separated from the mothership Kitty Hawk, the landing computer began flashing an alarm. The abort switch had an intermittent short that would trigger an automatic abort sequence if it happened during the powered stage of Antares' descent to the surface. At Mission Control, though they couldn't fix the switch, they decided to reprogram the computer so it would ignore the spurious alert. They had two hours to work out the new code. It fell to MIT programmer Don Isles, who came up with a workaround. The new sequence was tested in a simulator, and then the 61 keystrokes required were read up to the astronauts. The landing proceeded with pinpoint accuracy. The lunar module had landed on a seven degree incline that made moving in the cabin difficult. They were about one kilometer from the rim of Cone Crater where they were scheduled to collect samples during this second moonwalk. As with every successful Apollo moon landing mission, the astronauts unfurled the American flag. Before Apollo 11, it had been proposed that the United Nations flag be planted, but Congress had passed a law stating that no flag other than the stars and stripes could be deployed. During previous lunar missions, astronauts had spoken about how difficult it was to judge distances and to recognize landmarks. Shepard and Mitchell were tiring during their climb toward the rim of Cone Crater. Doctors at Mission Control monitoring their heart rates became concerned. They were ordered to return without realizing they were only 20 meters from their objective. but NASA was about to eliminate this problem. Apollo astronauts were training with a new piece of hardware. All remaining missions would be able to travel 10 times further from the lunar module using the new lunar rover. Geology was the main feature of the remaining Apollo missions. Preliminary analysis was showing that the moon had once been molten with rocks containing no trace of water. Dave Scott would command Apollo 15. Jim Irwin was the lunar module pilot. This would be his first space flight. Al Warden was the command module pilot. Apollo 15 was also his first space flight. Refinements in the design of the Saturn V launch vehicle and improvements in the targeting and trajectory parameters meant that a heavier version of the lunar module could now reach the moon, carrying heavier loads. The new expanded missions were called J missions. Not only could they take more to the moon, they could bring a greater mass of lunar rock back to the Earth. Their target on the lunar surface was Hadley Rill, a peculiar winding groove, probably formed by ancient volcanic activity. The landing site was in the lunar northern hemisphere near the Apennine Mountains. Separation of the lunar module Falcon from the command module was delayed by a hatch problem, but this was soon solved. Landing techniques were now so refined that Scott was easily able to compensate for an early six kilometer aberration and set Falcon down for another pinpoint landing. <laughs> 
Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. The quality of television pictures from the moon had continued to improve as audiences across the United States dwindled. The big difference was the rover. Not only would it allow the astronauts to travel further and to carry more samples, but without exerting themselves, Scott and Irwin used less oxygen and could stay longer on the surface. Dave Scott had taken his geology training very seriously, and on the crew's second traverse in the lunar rover, this training paid off. They discovered a white rock at the bottom of the Hadley Rill, which was thought to be part of the lunar bedrock. It became known as the Genesis Rock, and it was more than four billion years old. After almost three days on the moon, Scott and Irwin prepared the Falcon for return to lunar orbit. There had only been a few minor glitches during the earlier parts of the mission, and rendezvous, docking and the crews back to Earth continued to remain problem-free. During the final descent, the remaining highly corrosive fuel from the capsule's thrusters was dumped, but this time it caused the collapse of one of the craft's three parachutes. Further damage would have been catastrophic. The end of an era as the Apollo missions come to a close. As 1972 commenced, there were only two remaining Apollo missions. Though the lunar expeditions were increasing in duration and complexity, the American people had lost interest, and so had the political administration. Life-threatening difficulties occurred on every flight, but NASA had been so good at overcoming problems that the drama of lunar exploration was easily pushed off the front pages by war and political scandal. When the last ever mission to the moon blasted off at night during prime time, TV networks were annoyed that launch delays messed up their viewing schedule. Astronaut Gene Cernan would be the last man to walk on the moon, and with the return of Apollo 17 to the Earth, lunar exploration stopped. There are no plans to return to the moon.